Good afternoon. My name is Margaret Byron, and I will be presenting some work by my PhD student, Adrian Adena, along with some of our collaborators. We'll be talking about the role of spatial temporal asymmetry in metachronal paddling, particularly in tinafores or comb jellies. A common approach to moving fluid at low Reynolds numbers, that is, scenarios with high fluid viscosity, low velocity, or small size, is to use cilia, which is a flexible organelle that moves in a whip-like motion, as you can see here. Um, the motion has a power stroke, which pushes fluid to the left, and a recovery stroke, which moves it back to the starting point. Uh, and you would notice that the stroke of the cilium is asymmetric. Uh, this is because at low Reynolds number, flow is laminar and also time reversible. Viscous forces dominate over inertial forces, uh, so there's no possibility of gliding. As soon as you stop pushing on the fluid, it stops moving. Uh, and if you push symmetrically, like so, uh, in, in a symmetric path, the fluid is going to move symmetrically too. So if you're swimming at a low Reynolds number, then you have to move asymmetrically in order to, to move at all. Uh, and uh, groups of cilia coordinate their motion in metachronal waves, which have a distinct wavelength and a distinct frequency. And here you can see an antiplectic metachronal wave where each individual cilium uh, moves from right to left, but the wave uh, is moving from left to right. Uh, so. In this time reversible flow, uh, one byproduct is that the speed of the cilium doesn't really matter. So even if the power stroke is uh, very fast compared to the recovery stroke, uh, you're still going to move fluid in the same pattern. And, and if your stroke is spatially symmetric, you won't have any net fluid motion at all. So the goal here is net fluid displacement to either move yourself, um, that is to swim, or to pump fluid across a surface for feeding or ventilation or waste clearance or for some other purpose. Uh, but as long as we're in this low Reynolds number viscous dominated scenario, uh, we're going to need spatial asymmetry. Uh, and that's one reason why animals that swim at low Reynolds numbers use very different low motion strategies than those that swim at high Reynolds numbers. Um, and uh, what we can do is we can introduce temporal asymmetry by making the power stroke faster than the recovery stroke, uh, but that won't make a difference in the net fluid displacement as long as we're at low Reynolds number. Uh, we might want to do this for other reasons, as we'll see uh, later on. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on a group of animals called tinafores or comb jellies. Uh, these are the largest animals on Earth that rely on cilia to move themselves around. And each of them uh, has a rows of teens, which are uh, bundles of packed cilia that move as metachronally coordinated paddles. Um, and uh, even with only cilia, they can be remarkably fast and agile. So here's a sedipid tinafore, which is an ambush predator. It's got a long sticky tentacle spread out. It's drifting along with the flow until it catches a piece of prey. Uh, and then it has no problem transitioning into kind of a more active swimming mode where it can move quite quickly and, and turn very sharply. Um, so typical cilia are on uh, the order of tens of microns in length, um, and they operate at very low Reynolds numbers. But tinafore cilia, on the other hand, are on the order of about a millimeter in length, and they move at intermediate Reynolds numbers. Um, and in this situation, both fluid inertia and fluid viscosity are important. Uh, so unlike the possibility, or unlike what we were just talking about, uh, there is the possibility of gliding, that is, uh, fluid is continuing to move even after the paddle stops moving. Uh, so as you can imagine, that's this is really going to change the physical constraints on the system. Um, so this balance that we discussed between spatial and temporal asymmetry might now be a little bit different, uh, and we want to know how those two kinds of asymmetry can affect the fluid motion. Um, and in order to do that, uh, we're going to need to quantitatively define two different parameters. Um, so here you can see these white lines are the traces of a team plate beating over one power recovery cycle. You can see that the one on the left um, is uh, significantly um, more asymmetric than the one on the right. And so we need a way to quantify that. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to define a spatial asymmetry parameter, SA. Uh, we're going to define that as the area that is traced out by the tip of the team um, as, it, uh, as it goes through one cycle, divided by the ellipse that is inscribed in the half circle whose radius is the team length. Uh, and that seems really complicated, but uh, what we're kind of envisioning here is that the, uh, the team, if it was rigid, could have kind of a reachable set of this half circle. Um, but it's not rigid, it's flexible, uh, and so that, uh, that green ellipse is a kind of a more realistic upper bound for what that uh, team tip could trace out over one cycle. Um, and so if you think about it, you can say, okay, a, a value SA of approaching one means the stroke is very asymmetric, uh, and a value with approaching zero means that the stroke is, is fairly symmetric. Um, so there's our spatial asymmetry. We can also define a temporal asymmetry parameter, TA. 
Okay, um, and so here you can see um, on this side a plot uh, of the tip speed of the teen as it goes through uh, one beat cycle. Um, the white line is the average of many cycles and all the gray lines behind it are uh, our individual uh, beat cycles. And we're going to define our temporal asymmetry as the fraction of the beat cycle that is taken up by the recovery stroke. Uh, so uh, qualitatively, this means that a TA of 0.5 uh, would mean that this, the, the stroke is totally symmetric, the power stroke and the recovery stroke take the same amount of time. Um, a, uh, a TA value of above 0.5 would mean that TP is shorter than TR uh, and the power stroke is fast compared to the recovery stroke. Um, and a TA of less than 0.5 would mean that the recovery stroke is actually faster um, or taking place over less time than the uh, power stroke. Okay, so keep these parameters in the back pocket. We're going to come back to them and use them a lot. Um, and what we're motivated by is this question of what happens to SA and TA as the Reynolds number changes, both in behaving animals and from a theoretical perspective. Um, so how do these parameters change, or how should they change, as we move from lower to higher Reynolds numbers? Um, so uh, we, we did a bunch of experiments to try to, to see what was happening in the real animals. And we used two different locations to collect animals for the study. Um, the first one was the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences in uh, collaboration with uh, oceanographer Amy Moss, uh, mechanical engineer David Murphy. Um, and a lot of these experiments were carried out by Elizabeth Siebert, who's a former undergraduate student in our lab. Uh, we collected animals by snorkeling, primarily at, at Flats Inlet and the mouth of Harrington Sound in Bermuda, and then took the animals back to the marine lab to analyze. Uh, here you can see um, one of our specimens. You can see the metaconal waves uh, on the teen row very clearly. Uh, we looked at subsections of each of these rows to quantify the spatial and temporal asymmetry of the beating. Uh, we were also really fortunate to work with a crack team of aquarists at the Monterey Aquarium, uh, including Tommy Knowles, um, Wyatt Pitchy, and Mac Bubble. Um, and uh, so uh, we did uh, the same experiments there on a um, different species, same genus, uh, and uh, culture animals instead of wild. Uh, but the experiments were effectively done with a bright field imaging setup, which you'll see in more detail in the next slide. Uh, but here are the basics. Um, you have uh, an animal pinned to a slide with a portion of the team row that we're interested in examining kind of sticking out um, over the side where it can be imaged with a long working distance microscope objective um, and that's projecting those images back into a high-speed camera which is kind of offset to remove the vignetting around the edges of the image um, and then the whole setup is backlit with a collimated LED light source um, and the collimated LED makes the shadows uh, very nice and sharp so we can see um, the outlines of the teens uh, as they're beating um, and uh, you can see in this table here, uh, the, the number of animals that we collected from the two different sites, the range of body lengths, uh, and the range of Reynolds numbers of the teen. So here to define a Reynolds number, we're using the teen length, um, the beating frequency, and the fluid kinematic viscosity. So this is kind of an oscillatory uh, Reynolds numbers. Um, and there are some differences in the, the wild and the cultured animals in terms of the range of body lengths uh, that we observed and also in the range of teen Reynolds numbers, but that's probably okay because the whole goal is to maximize uh, the range of Reynolds numbers that we are um, analyzing. But I, I will show these two data sets uh, separately um, for the most part. So uh, here you can see a breakdown of our experimental setup. Um, you can see that the, the collimated LED backlights not just the specimen and not just the teens, but also the fluid tracer particles that we put into the water. Um, here we're using algae as a fluid tracer. The algae is technically motile, so it's not 100% passive tracer, um, but it does swim uh, much more slowly than the flow speed that we're trying to record, so that's okay. Um, we can track the shadows of the algae tracers uh, and use particle shadow velocimetry, um, which is uh, similar to but not identical to uh, PIV, particle image velocimetry, which you may be familiar with. Um, some, some differences in the back end in terms of image processing, but the principles are, are very similar. Um, uh, and, and so what we can do then is we can calculate the velocity fields uh, behind the teens. And that won't play, but you can see that uh, uh, the resolution there um, is, uh, is very nice. Um, between the uh, the teens and also in the far field. Um, and so we can get really nice resolution, um, uh, but unfortunately I'm not gonna actually be talking uh, about any of these data uh, today. So what we're really gonna be focusing on is the kinematics of the teen tip. Uh, and, and this is really all we need to get our asymmetry parameters, SA and TA. Um, and uh, we can calculate SA and TA then for each beat of each teen of each animal in our data set. Okay, so here we can see SA and TA plotted against Reynolds number for all of the animals. 
Um, the filled circles, the large filled circles, are the average of all the observed beats of all the observed teens for a single animal. Uh, and the smaller background markers are the individual beats of individual teens. Um, and the blue symbols are the data from uh, BIOS, and the pink ones are from the Monterey Aquarium. Uh, we can see um, some interesting trends with Reynolds numbers. As Reynolds number increases, we can see that spatial asymmetry decreases, um, and also that temporal asymmetry increases. Uh, and this makes sense, because like we said earlier, at a low Reynolds number, increasing the speed of the power stroke it doesn't change the fluid displacement. Um, you have to increase the spatial asymmetry, and that's what we see at the low Reynolds numbers. We see kind of a dramatic increase in the, the spatial asymmetry. Um, but at very low Reynolds number, or at higher Reynolds number, we see uh, TA kind of start to climb um, because uh, at this regime, it does make sense to have a faster uh, power stroke. Um, and SA kind of kind of levels off at those higher Reynolds numbers, uh, which indicates that it might not be as effective a strategy uh, to keep changing your spatial asymmetry in order to generate more fluid displacement rather than just uh, adjusting your, your temporal asymmetry. Um, so this is a cool observation, uh, but uh, um, ideally we would like to understand and explore this problem a little bit more mechanistically to better understand the physics uh, behind what's going on. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a very simple uh, mathematical model of the teen row. Um, so uh, the real team moves in a, in a complex pattern, kind of like the one you can see up there in, in the corner. Um, but we want to simplify this motion as much as possible while still capturing the essential qualities of the motion. So what we're going to do is we're going to model the teen um, as a moving flat plate whose area changes with time. So the height of the plate is changing um, with time. Uh, we're going to make the tip of the flat plate trace out an elliptical path similar to the real teen tip. Uh, and we're going to uh, be able to manipulate the geometry of that uh, ellipse to change the spatial asymmetry. And we're going to be able to change the speed at which the tip of the, the plate goes around it in order to change the spatial asymmetry. Um, the top of the ellipse is set at the, the full length of the teen. And uh, we can determine the geometry by setting the spatial asymmetry SA as well as the stroke amplitude. We can set both SA and the stroke amplitude um, in, in our code. Uh, so just like before, we're defining spatial asymmetry SA as the area traced out by the tip of the, of the quote unquote teen um, over the ellipse that can be inscribed in the half circle uh, that is the reachable set. Uh, and so uh, it's, a, it's the same definition as before. Um, and then after we've done this, uh, we can set up as many teens as we want in a row, we can give them a frequency and a phase lag um, and all of that, and we can kind of uh, have look at what, what happens when we put a bunch of them next to each other. Um, so here's the kinematics that prescribes the motion. Uh, the next step is to use this kinematics that we just outlined to uh, calculate the force that's actually generated by the simulated teen rooms. Uh, there's a lot of math on this slide, uh, it looks like, but, it, but it's actually a quite a simple model. So let's start um, over here uh, in the upper right hand corner. Um, we need to find theta as the parametric angle that gets swept out by the teen tip as it moves around the ellipse. Um, theta dot, the angular velocity is piecewise defined. We can say there's a constant theta dot during the power stroke and a constant theta dot during the recovery stroke. And we can change those two uh, theta dots to, to change the temporal asymmetry um, TA. Uh, and so uh, it's a piecewise defined. Um, but uh, then from there, it's just a little bit of trigonometry and a little bit of calculus to get the coordinates of the teen tip, XA and YA. Uh, and that's what we can feed into our force. Uh, and so the force that's generated by each plate is just a, is near kind of your uh, standard drag. You've got um, one half of the, um, the one half times the fluid density times the drag coefficient times the projected area times uh, the velocity squared. Uh, two things are a little bit less than standard. One is that we're incorporating a phase lag. So when we sum up all the teens, we have to import, uh, incorporate a phase lag of, of T naught um, so that all, all the teens are at the right place in their cycle. Um, and the other is that the drag coefficient, because we're working at intermediate Reynolds number, the drag coefficient is not a constant. Um, so the drag coefficient is not a constant. Uh, it is itself a function of a period parameter and a Reynolds number, which are based on the frequency of the teen omega uh, and the maximum um, tip speed xa dot max. Okay, um, so uh, we've got our, our drag model. We can calculate the total force uh, developed by the teen row here, uh, and that's a function of time. We can also calculate the power required to move the teens. That's just going to be the force uh, times the velocity. Um, and we can integrate that force to get the net work required to move through a single beat cycle um, 
Uh, and we can also take the average over a single beat cycle to kind of get a, a, an average net force that's generated by the teens. Um, so uh, this is a really simplified model, obviously. It, it doesn't take into account any interactions between the teens. The only thing it really does is put a phase lag uh, in between them. So it's definitely not going to be able to, for example, predict the actual value of the force developed by a real teen row in an animal, uh, but it, it might be a handy way to look at some, some very big, broad patterns. Uh, uh, for example, we can see that uh, changing the phase lag between the teens can really change the intermittency or the, the steadiness of the developed force. Um, here we can see the, the force per teen on average over three beat cycles. Um, and uh, even the, the average force um, kind of stays pretty much the same. Um, in a real system, uh, the phase lag would change the average force, but remember we're not uh, simulating any of the flow interaction between the teens. We're just adding up a bunch of forces from a bunch of moving plates uh, that happen to be next to each other. Um, so there's the phase lag. Uh, we can also manipulate our asymmetry parameters. So let's give our model a fixed Reynolds number, um, a fixed SA, spatial asymmetry, uh, and a fixed phase lag, and see what happens when we mess with the uh, temporal asymmetry. Um, so here we can see uh, that a temporal asymmetry that's less than 0.5, um, uh, that is where the power stroke is slower than the recovery stroke, uh, produces a force that's, that's mostly negative. Um, and uh, increasing the temporal asymmetry uh, increases the overall force, uh, but it also concentrates the power stroke into kind of a, a narrower peak. Um, this makes sense uh, at the Reynolds number that we're choosing to simulate here. It's above one, uh, which means that changing the, the speed of the power versus the recovery stroke actually is going to make a difference. Um, that's interesting, of course, but it's, it's very likely that we would see different effects at lower or higher uh, Reynolds numbers. Um, so that's that's TA. Let's take a look at what happens when we manipulate SA. Um, here we've got, a, again, a constant Reynolds number, a constant phase lag, and this time we're holding temporal asymmetry constant. Um, and uh, you can see here that because we're holding TA constant, the timing of the power and recovery stroke remains constant, um, but uh, that there are some differences between the magnitude of the force developed during the power uh, versus the recovery stroke, um, because we're changing that, the area of that ellipse, as you can see um, over here. Uh, so for the lower SA, this kind of inverse thrust from the, the paddles moving backward um, during the recovery stroke, uh, is, is producing negative thrust during some portion of, of the cycle. Uh, but as we increase uh, SA, the, uh, the overall force stays above zero at all times. Um, so remember that we're adding the forces together for the whole row, so because there's a phase lag, we can have a scenario where the net force is always positive. Um, and again, this is just for one Reynolds number at a fixed phase lag and a fixed uh, TA. So what we really need is a way to look at all these parameters together. Um, and here's where it starts to get interesting. Um, so in our model, uh, the three main parameters can vary independently. Um, uh, and in any two plots, um, the, each line represents a different value of SA. So blue is low SA, red is medium, and yellow is high. And this, this actually corresponds to uh, the range that we tend to see um, in our animals. Um, and uh, the top row is the work required to complete one cycle, and the bottom row is the, the average net force for one cycle, all plotted versus temporal asymmetry TA. Um, and... Uh, in the top row, you can see that uh, a lower SA requires more work and a higher TA requires more work, uh, which, which makes sense. Um, but interestingly, what we can do is we can find um, kind of an optimal TA, which minimizes the work required to move the teen at a given value of SA. Um, so let's call this uh, TA star, um, just kind of optimal TA. So, and this TA star is a function of both Reynolds number RE uh, and spatial asymmetry SA. Um, and at uh, low SA, the optimum is higher, uh, but as SA increases, it kind of converges towards 0.5, which is when uh, the power and recovery stroke are exactly equal in time. Um, so we can also look at the net force developed by the teen row, uh, and as we expect, uh, at higher, at, uh, excuse me, at, at low Reynolds numbers, um, TA doesn't matter. Uh, in terms of force production, right? Changing, changing TA does nothing. You have to change your spatial asymmetry uh, in order to, to move fluid around. Uh, by that higher level number, there's a different pattern. Um, so let's say you're, for whatever reason, you're moving uh, in this part of the space, right? You're, you're at a low TA and a low SA, uh, and you want to increase your propulsive force. Um, so you could increase SA um, to get more force, uh, but you could, uh, you could also increase TA. Um, but as you increase TA, um, What's interesting is that there comes a point where increasing your spatial asymmetry doesn't actually help, um, and it actually uh, gives you less force. Um, and uh, 
these lines here are arbitrary constant values of SA, but you can see that depending on where you are in, uh, in the SA TA space, further changes of SA and TA can change your force differently, right? So it's not monotonic. Uh, there comes a point where increasing your, your spatial asymmetry is counterproductive and it's going to give you um, actually less force uh, at a given temporal asymmetry. Um, so this also depends on the Reynolds number. Um, at higher Reynolds numbers, right, this transition point um, where further increases in SA don't increase the force, move to the left um, over towards lower TA. Um, so these effects are interactive, uh, and even though SA and TA may vary independently, uh, their effects on overall force are not independent. Um, so let's, let's come back to this concept of optimal TA. Uh, TA star, which represents the temporal asymmetry that minimizes uh, the work. And the pattern we're seeing here um, is, is a little bit strange because uh, at lower Reynolds numbers, everything kind of converges to 2.5. Um, so we alter our model a little bit uh, to be a better fit to these low Reynolds numbers and to explore what's going on at uh, Reynolds numbers of 1 and below. Okay, so uh, we recoded the model, this time using a, a constant drag coefficient and a force that's linearly proportional to the velocity uh, instead of proportional to the velocity squared, which is much more appropriate for these very low Reynolds number of flows. Um, and again, uh, you can see on the bottom row that TA it does not change the net force that we get at all, right? And that's, that's what we expect at low Reynolds numbers, uh, but it does change the work that's required to execute the stroke. Um, and in this case, what's really interesting is that TA star uh, ends up below 0.5, um, and this means that the recover stroke is actually faster than the power stroke. Uh, and this effect is uh, is most prominent at high values of SA, um, the yellow lines, which makes sense because the, the plate projected area then um, is much smaller on the recovery stroke, uh, so it's less work to move it. Uh, so a, a really high spatial asymmetry, um, it would be uh, a lot less work to make that recovery stroke faster. Um, and uh, and so at an SA of, of zero, uh, totally symmetric, um, there would be no energetic advantage, uh, and we would expect TA star to converge uh, towards that value of 0.5. Um, and so this answers a question that was really mystifying when we looked at the experimental data. We saw that um, at low Reynolds numbers, um, quite a few actually um, of the animals had, were displaying um, TA uh, of less than 0.5. And this confused us because we didn't really see a reason for the power stroke to be slower than the recovery stroke. Uh, but now we have a clue. Uh, it might be because it costs less to do it that way, and it doesn't affect uh, the overall force production. Um, and so uh, it also makes sense that then at low Reynolds number we see more spatial asymmetry um, because at a uh, low Reynolds number, high spatial asymmetry and a uh, TA below 0.5 are what maximize force production while minimizing work. Um, and so this is all very well and good, uh, but, uh, but how close are the experimental data to these kind of theoretical optima from this extremely simplified model? Uh, so let's take a look. Um, here you can see all the raw data for each beat of each teen across all animals and across all Reynolds numbers in the data set. Um, so just, just a, a data vomit right here onto this slide. Um, but uh, what we've done here is plotted SA, the spatial asymmetry, on the horizontal axis. You can see that it ranges from about 0.2 to 0.7. Um, and then on the vertical axis, we're going to plot the residual between the measured TA and the calculated optimum TA star. Um, and TA star is a function of both SA and Reynolds number uh, for, for each beat of each teen of each animal. Um, and we can see that uh, the residual is not random. Um, it is more likely to be beating closer to TA star, and it's rare to see the teens get very far away from it. And a, a little bit more intuitive way to look at these data um, are to uh, look at a cumulative distribution function. Um, uh, and we can see that about, about 80% of the beats that are measured fall within 0.1 uh, of our measured TA, so our residual is, is pretty small. Um, and this isn't that predictive since the range of variation uh, of TA is pretty small, it only, it only varies through about 0.3 to 0.7, uh, but I think it's pretty exciting that such a rough model uh, can be even a little predictive of what's actually going on. Um, so just to kind of recap and summarize, um, we, uh, we used a combination of experiments uh, with a simple mathematical model to learn about the role of spatial and temporal asymmetry in a row of metaphorically moving appendages. Um, and, and these could be teens, or, or uh, from the model, they could be, they could be anything. Um, it could be legs. Uh, and so from the experiments, we learned that teen force specifically used different asymmetry strategies at different Reynolds numbers. Uh, and with some insight from our model, we concluded that this might be driven by efficiency and energetics. Uh, and from the model, we learned that uh, SA and TA interact in, in somewhat surprising and, and non-intuitive ways, depending on where you are in the parameter space defined by Reynolds number SA and TA, uh, and whether your goal is to increase force, uh, maybe for an escape maneuver, or whether it's to decrease required work, uh, maybe for steady swimming, um, you might change your asymmetry in uh, different ways. 
Um, so I hope that I have shown you uh, that there's a lot to think about when it comes to spatial temporal asymmetry in metachronal paddling. Um, and I, I welcome your questions uh, and look forward to discussing these uh, interesting problems with you. Um, I would also like to make a plug uh, for a talk in the complementary section. Um, uh, Adrian will be unpacking the three-dimensional kinematics of freely swimming tinafores. Uh, they're capable of some really amazing feats of agility, so, so please do check out his talk. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the organizations that sponsored this work, uh, the National Academy's Keck Futures Initiative, uh, or NACFI, and the Classic Foundation of Mexico. So thank you very much uh, for your time and attention, and I look forward to your questions.